This is Professor Dan Scollin, and I'm going to be giving a lecture entitled, What is GIS? And I'm giving a version of a definition of GIS, apps, methods, and tools for managing, analyzing, and displaying geographic data. And um, you can see next to my name there, I am a geographer. I have a master's degree in geography. I have a bachelor's degree in computer science, which made me sort of a natural for geographic information systems. I'm also a, a GISP, or a certified geographic information systems professional. So I wanted to start off with going through a little bit of a case study. And uh, this is actually something I pulled some data together a couple of years ago. We're going to be looking at fire mapping in the Klamath and talking about some geospatial and cartographic methods. And so we will um, start off with uh, some images, some th things that are familiar to you in the North State here, uh, Mount Shasta from Castle Crags, photo of a brewer spruce, a, a fairly rare endemic species in the um, Klamath Mountains, a uh, area where you can see uh, the, um, again, something quite familiar to a Sierra Pacific Industries land. This uh, area here uh, in the Russian Mountains, this was uh, a couple of days before I encountered this uh, storm, this lightning strike in the uh, area in the high in the high mountains here and of course these are some of the riskiest uh, sources of fire and indeed this area which now I'm rendering in um, Google Earth and uh, the lightning strike that you saw a minute ago was taken from this location and and here we're just rendering satellite imagery over an elevation model. We'll talk about how those sorts of things are done. You see some of the named peaks that Google Earth shows. And then this is what my photo looked like from this, uh, from this same location. And of course, um, this uh, is a devastating uh, time for wildfire. Uh, most of us have been affected by wildfire. Indeed, the lightning strike that you saw initiated a series of fires that burned for about two months. And um, this is the Coffee Creek area. You can see all the timber that was burned. You can see uh, erosion problems stemming from this. You can see damaged equipment. Uh, this was actually a kind of a refuge for the uh, Coffee Creek folks uh, at the time that this, this fire burned. And... Um, this hit close to home because I had been up in this area with my wife and kids and some of their friends a couple of years ago. And uh, I went ahead and just uh, took kind of a base map screenshot of this area and, uh, and then showed where these are located. So you can see the Caribou Lakes labeled on the base map. These are the Caribou Lakes on the left and uh, some of the other locations where we were uh, hiking through. And I then went ahead and grabbed the fire map from the fire that we were just talking about. So Coffee Creek is just a little bit north and east of where this is located. And you can see, so this would be an opportunity to come back in and examine these areas after the fact, see uh, what sort of fire effects we might be encountering. Again, we've got lots of, um, lots of opportunities to exploit um, location information, especially because our cell phones are GPS enabled. So I took these photos on my iPhone. You can see kind of the vicinity of where I was near the Pacific Crest Trail. And you can see that there was a significant amount of burn in this uh, particular location. And so I just went ahead and grabbed this location data and that's where this was located. So I, I uh, geocoded that location, um, basically took those coordinates and dropped it into the map. And um, so, you know, these are, are not strictly GIS operations, but rather just taking advantage of some of these uh, location technologies, what are sometimes called, um, well, broadly geographic or, or geospatial technologies. 
And, uh, and so we're focused more on the specifics of, of GIS. And, and um, of course, many, many agencies uh, are relying on geographic information systems these days, including the National Interagency Fire Center, CAL FIRE, all of the firefighting and, and fire protection operations, including local governments, city of Reading, county of Shasta, and so forth, are, are relying on, on these data and, and increasingly providing access over the internet to tools for, for the public to be able to view and, and take advantage of some of this, this information. So now we're going to talk a little bit about more specifically about what GIS is. And I like to describe it as an integrative tool in the sense that it integrates um, data and information from a wide array of sources. And so a geographic information system or, or geographic information rather can come from a variety of sources, right? We can take, you know, familiar photos to us. We can uh, go out and conduct field surveys. We can do wildlife surveys or transects where we collect data. Um, global positioning systems, satellite imagery, and of course maps. And so we just have your basic um, topographic map here represented. But the idea is that by taking uh, this, you know, maps and information about the environment and combining those on computers using computer software and uh, apps and, and related tools, uh, basically this is what uh, GIS provides us with. GIS is the defining geospatial technology. So um, this slide is illustrating how uh, geospatial technologies include global positioning systems, remote sensing and image processing from uh, satellites, for example, uh, popular geographics. So I showed you some examples like using Google Earth. Uh, but then within GIS itself, the largest of these bubbles, uh, we have database graphics and related tools that allow us to be able to uh, take advantage of this, uh, this geographic data. And um, well, remember this three things in the opening slide, we can organize and manage that data, we can analyze relationships, and we can display that data in the form of maps or visualizations, animations, those sorts of things. So the idea of a data layer is fundamental to GIS. And I've got two different images that reflect this. And it's you might want to start here on the lower right-hand corner and see the sort of real-world view that you might imagine yourself you know, in a low-flying aircraft or up on a tower. Uh, looking down on the landscape, lots and lots of different kinds of information. And what GIS is going to do is it's going to separate out and say, well, we've got some data that is land use based data. Okay, so you have maybe, uh, you know, a, a suburban home area here. Um, you have some f maybe forested areas. You've got a city, obviously a river going through. Uh, and then we could also have elevation data in there. Uh, then we might overlay the ownership parcels of land. And we could throw the streets on top of that and customers. And each of these are going to be treated as distinct data sets that we can then combine and turn on and off and analyze relationships between uh, these different layers. Uh, another uh, example where it comes through and it says, you know, we could have building layers and uh, how that's used in a map context and where we may have gotten that data from and then how we represent it. And here they describe it as being represented by polygons um, and polygons are enclosed areas. Uh, then we have points of interest. OK, and uh, and then these would actually be represented as points. And then we've got parcels, which are also are polygons. And then we have streets, which they're describing as polylines or more generally just lines. And so points, lines, and polygons are the fundamental building blocks of uh, geographic information in the GIS context uh, under 
what we know as the vector model. And the vector model lends itself to uh, mapping out, well, streets if you have lines, if you've got parcels, polygons are ideally suited, if you've got point locations, points are ideally suited. And we could say, okay, we've got points, lines, and polygons in these first three. Now these two, you'll notice, have a grid appearance to them. And that's the second basic model of representing data, which is with uh, these grid cells. This is what we call the raster model. And this is the vector model. And we'll talk more about those uh, moving forward. So there is an abundance of sources of geographic or GIS data. And so we can derive things from existing geographic databases. We can grab them from uh, aerial imagery. We can go out and collect GPS field data. We can uh, go out and census population, for example, or we can use satellite imagery. And satellite imagery takes a, a wide array of forms. So uh, this is a remotely sensed image in false color infrared, which is showing where you've got um, bright red represents healthy vegetation in this case. And then uh, we can actually use this to extract data from and to produce uh, polygons. This might be a land use layer derived from this imagery. And uh, we actually teach a remote sensing course as part of our program. So that's one of the second semester courses uh, and it, one that's required for forestry, natural resource management, geography, a number of different university degrees will require a remote sensing course. GIS data is stored in databases uh, that store geographic data. And uh, we call this a geo database, at least in the ArcGIS world, uh, the term geo database is used. And what you'll notice is that within this geo database, we can store attribute tables, feature classes, cartographic representations, annotation, and a variety of other things. Now, a lot of those things won't mean very much to you, but know that databases are designed to organize information. And we can have geographic databases that are oriented around spatial or geographic data, or you can have a conventional database that might store student information for Shasta College. And you'll notice that uh, they distinguish between a single user database and a multi-user database. So larger organizations, it'll become a little bit more complex. We'll deal much more uh, in this course on this left side as a single user geodatabase. Now, if we talk about an individual layer of data, we're going to have a spatial and an attribute component. And this is really dealing more with the vector model, your points, lines, and polygons. So here we've got polygons. Again, these look like residential parcels. And with each of these residential parcels, you will have a co corresponding attribute record that will store descriptive or numeric data in table form that associates back to that uh, spatial data. Um, so, you know, obviously a lot of kind of abstract computer -y concepts, which um, is something that we'll have to do at some point here in, in our course as we, as we plunge into things, that, that's sort of the dry part of it. Um, the really cool part to me is getting students out. Um, I've got a field class coming up this semester and um, getting on the landscape and, and reading maps and, and learning to interpret the landscape, capturing information and data out in the field. And, and uh, we can take that data and we can actually map its location uh, using a mobile device. And then we can upload that data to our um, computers, to our geographic information system when we get back into the lab. And this is really where the power of, of GIS comes from. Uh, obviously, a uh, abundance of um, wildlife and uh, plant life, and a lot of you guys are learning about these in different courses. And again, just to be able to um, 
as we uh, work to try to maintain wildlife habitat, to preserve uh, threatened and endangered plant species and manage resources for timber and, and what have you, um, that geographic information systems is a really fundamental tool that we rely on. Um, many of you have seen things like these USGS land markers located this out in the field. Some, some of you have seen these bearing trees before with township and range and section on them, uh, fire information maps and what have you. And so we get a lot of different types of, of information. And so in the Geog 9 class, in the Map and Geospatial Principles class, you'll learn about some of these different uh, ways in which maps and map data can be represented. And then of course, uh, this data will then be incorporated and inform our GIS activities. Um, again, a variety of activities that I've been involved with. I'm actually uh, working with some folks uh, from um, Borneo, from Malaysian Borneo, that came out to visit and had an exchange with the Yurok on the North Coast. And uh, this is part of a uh, participatory mapping program where we're uh, providing these tools and capabilities to indigenous populations to be able to help them to map their own lands and uh, and many times those are then incorporated into a geographic information system. Again, lots of different ways that we can uh, kind of visualize data. Um, so in this case, I was um, I talked about this uh, this location actually. So this is where uh, the lake where I took the uh, the lightning strike picture. You can see the raindrops falling on Big Blue Lake, and uh, I used an app that uh, allows you to. It's called River Run, and you can locate any feature in North America, any any location, and it will show you where if you had a raindrop where that would or how that would travel to meet the sea. And so uh, this is the area of, uh, of the Salmon River. So located about here, this picture of the Salmon River Canyon. And then down here, I sort of blow this up to show you in, in 3D what that area looks like. This is a Google Earth shot and then showing the mouth of the Klamath River. And again, the idea here is just to show how we can visualize, we can take geographic information and visualize it using these various tools um, to make something that uh, is um, compelling and interesting and helps us to understand the world that we're in. So for our, uh, for our Shasta College program, um, we have a uh, certificate and an associate's degree um, we also host a ArcGIS online web-based GIS, which you guys will delve into. You're going to be exposed to this. You probably already have uh, because you have to download and install the software. Uh, and then uh, we are also one of the partners on the NorthStateGIS.org website, and there's information and resources in this location where you can learn more about things that are happening here in the North State with respect to GIS. And closing with a quote, nature is not a place to visit, it is home. And uh, so with that, um, we'll close out this short lecture and we will see you online. <laughs>